he or she is done with that life, they turn to bread. Father Greg has founded Homeboy Industries in 1986 to provide work experience, therapy, and the opportunity for once rival gang members to work side by side. Homeboy Industries is now a national model that serves 8,000 gang members from 700 different gangs and was the focus of the documentary Father G and the Homeboys, narrated by Martin Sheen. Tattoos on the Heart is a collection of amazing stories and essays about the men and women whom Father Greg has met over the years. It is a treatise on the sacredness of each life, an outstanding rebuttal to the idea that any one life matters more than one another. Following this presentation, Father Greg will be happy to take your questions. I'll pass around this microphone, so please wait for it before you speak. Father Greg will then sign copies of his book for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming the boundlessly compassionate Father Greg Boyle to the store. Just uh, for the brief time I have with you this evening is that what we hope to create really is a community of kinship such that God might in fact recognize it. That's what the book is about. It's about an idea that uh, there is no us and them, there's just us, only always been us. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that we belong? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside of that circle? And to that end, I think our common call, really, is to uh, stand as close as we can get to the margins, to the poor, the powerless, and the voiceless, uh, to stand with those whose dignity has been denied stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And when, if we're lucky, we can even get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop, or with the disposable, but so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. That's sort of the idea, I think, if there's a overarching idea of what this book is about. It calls us to kind of our deepest longing, which is to create a community of kinship. Uh, the homies are always teaching me things at, at Homeboy Industries, homies and all girls, um, endless things in the last quarter of a century. One, one of the main things lately is texting. Since I'm in, I'm, what did we do before we had texting? Uh, it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. So I, I, I was... Um, uh, and I text a lot because I'm on the road currently because of the book. And so, uh, so I'm quite good at it now. I'm very kind of dexterous, uh, LOL and OMG and ATW. And, and there's a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for Oh Hell No. And, um, and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. So, so I'm with two homies, in, uh, Poncho and Manuel, and we're driving to um, Palm Springs to speak at a high school. And... Uh, we meet at the office, they do a variety of things at Homeboy Industries, which is a big, huge headquarters if you ever get to LA. 
And um, so we meet and we make this two hour drive and somewhere a half hour into the trek, um, Manuel gets a text, you know, I can hear this little zzz. And, and he starts to chuckle, I say, well, what is it? Oh, it's dumb, it's Snoopy from the office. Well, Snoopy works with Manuel in the clock-in room. They clock in hundreds of gang members every day who work at Homeboy Industries. It's not a pleasant job because you have to uh, hang out with them, you know, because they argue over their uh, time cards and that kind of thing. So um, I said, well, what's it say? Oh, God. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest Vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, you know, we, I nearly swerved in oncoming traffic, you know, and then I, I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. That they are from rival gangs. That they used to shoot bullets at each other. And now they shoot text messages. <laughs> And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How can we uh, seek a compassion that in fact can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? So that's sort of the goal. You know, I think you, you don't, kinship is a thing that sort of presents itself to us uh, uh, all the time. You blink and you miss it, and you don't want to miss it. Uh, I guess I never felt this more keenly in my life than uh, a number of years ago. I, I did battle with uh, cancer, with leukemia. I went through uh, chemotherapy and feeling okay at the moment. And, or as the homies endlessly say, I hear your cancer's in intermission. <laughs> Apparently it stepped up to the lobby to buy some popcorn. <laughs> and hopefully the money will be long here. So, um, But it was announced on the front page of the LA Times, Sunday edition. And so... Um, uh, you know, word spread, and, and the homies and homegirls sort of came out of the woodwork. You know, they uh, they would leave me voicemail messages, like a homie, a homegirl named Gina. Now it's our turn to take care of you, she says. Very sweet. Uh, I remember a big, huge vato named Grumpy, six foot three, standing in front of my desk, big tears in his eyes. Uh, apparently God had forgotten to give him a neck. You know, he was standing there looking quite uh, uh, stricken. And uh, he says, what do I have that you need? You know, meaning organs. Uh, uh, I was really happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs, but it was, it was the thought that counted. Uh, one of my favorites was a little knucklehead gang member, uh, 15 years old, kid who kind of came late in the game. Um, I was already going through my chemotherapy, and I'd still go to the office because I'd rather be there than just about anywhere. And um, he comes walking in, and... And he plunks himself down, he looks positively stricken, and he says, I hear you have leukemia. And I said, yeah, I do. And, and there was this awkward silence. And then he says, my cat had leukemia. <laughs> yeah, she died. He says, oh, gosh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'm awfully glad you stopped by. It just, you know, picked me right up there. Uh... My all-time favorite was a, a homie named Robert uh, Loco. Everybody called him Loco, and he called me from jail collect. And, uh, and he just read this in the LA Times. He says, hey, what's up with this leukemia anyway? And I said, well, it's cancer. You know, it's in, it's in the blood. The doctor says my white count's too high. He goes, the doctors, they don't be knowing nothing. I said, well, what are you talking about? Well, hello, of course your white counts. Uh, you white. <laughs> so I, I get a lot of second opinions. <laughs> and suddenly there's kinship. It's not about service provider, service recipient. It's about us. Just us. Uh, I remember a homie uh, named Dreamer who was... Uh, probably got more jobs from uh, me at Homeboy Industries than just about anybody. And he was, um, but he would lose them and he'd wander back into criminality or drug selling or drug use in and out of prison. 95 jobs, I'm sure I've gotten them over the course. And he comes in right out of prison, a little brief stretch, three, uh, three years. And he comes in and he, uh, he says, uh, I won't let you down this time, please. You know, I, I just really need a job. And, and I know I've let you down in the past. 
so I pick up the phone and I call up a friend of mine who works at a um, uh, vending machine company in Alhambra. And he hires Caesar right off the bat. And, and so uh, Caesar uh, uh, begins work, and two weeks later he comes, uh, you know, waving this very proudly this first paycheck. And he says, Damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel so good. My mom, she's proud of my kids. They're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, oh, goodness. Who? And he said, well, God, of course. I said, oh, sure. Gosh, yeah. Absolutely. And he said, you thought I was going to say you, didn't you? Oh, no, gosh, God's number one. Yeah. And he says, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. And I go, I'm sorry, them Genesis days. He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already. By you. <laughs> well, we died laughing, you know, and it was suddenly the kinship so quickly. But more than that, you know, there was no sense of service provider, service recipient. There was kind of no distance, really. And that's what you want. Service, of course, is great, you know. But service is the hallway, and it leads to the ballroom. And the ballroom is kinship, where you obliterate once and for all this illusion that we're separate. Oh Boy Industries was founded uh, when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Elisa Village. Together, they comprise the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs uh, at board there when I rolled up as, as kind of a new belief pastor. Uh, one African American set of seven Latino gangs, uh, all at war with each other, remember. And uh, I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in uh, 1988. I buried my 168th uh, young person killed because of gang violence. Uh, four months ago, a young man named Keith. And so we just did a lot of things, you know, we, we uh, first thing we did is we started the school, because that, that's what gang members most needed at, at, at that time. There were a lot of junior high age kids, gang members, who didn't have a place to go. And so well, we started the school, and that brought gang members to the church, which sort of upset uh, the sort of the notion of what church ought to be, you know, hermetically sealed, good people in, bad people out, and that sort of chasseled with that idea. And uh, and so once they came to the church, they kept saying, if only uh, we had jobs. So we went, uh, all of us in the parish there, we went searching for felony-friendly uh, employers, you know, and that was a challenge. And so since that wasn't so forthcoming, we said, well, let's start our own businesses since the demand was so great. So we started Homeboy Bakery in uh, 1992, shortly after the unrest in the city. And then uh, a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown LA, if you're familiar with the, the geography there. And once we had two businesses, we came up with the highfalutin Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this, you know. And